This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's The Ramsey Show, where dad is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your life, your money, your mental wellness, your relationships, your boundaries, your career, your job. We talk about you right here in front of you. It's called The Ramsey Show. Open phones at 888-825-5225. The call is free, and some say the advice is worth exactly what you pay for it. We're going to start with Gene in Denver. Hey, Gene, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hi. Just retired from my job. I'm collecting a pension of about $5,300, but it has a condition where I could take less, 25% less, and keep that for my wife should I pass, and that would be about 3900 And the advice I've been told is to take out a universal life policy with a long-term care writer to save that $1,300 to pay for the insurance. Uh, do you think that's wise? I've got a paid-for house. I don't have any debt. I'm debt-free, and I've got about 750000 in my savings IRA. I missed you. You kind of cut out when you said where that horrible advice came from. <laughs> yeah, it's from my financial advisors. Oh, you need a new one. He, you have an insurance salesman. Right. Yeah. Um, he's, not an, he's not a financial advisor. He's an insurance salesman because he's selling a whole life. No one else sells that crap except people that are in the insurance business. So, no, I, if you want to buy some insurance, what's your net worth? Uh, it's $1.1 million. Okay. And how much of that is the house? Uh, about 400000 Okay. So you got $700,000 in investments. Roughly. Well, about 750. It yeah. all depends what my house would go for. Yeah. Uh, he said that I could invest in the whole life so that it would be tax-free to convert my 401k into a factory should I die. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It would be tax-free to, to convert, your, convert your 401k into what? Into a life, uh, universal whole life. Uh, well, that's not, if, that's if I not, die. Yeah, that's true because you lose all the money. So usually right. when you I lose mean, all your money, it's tax-free. So, no, right. you need to get away from this guy. Kid. He's horrible. Uh, his advice is horrible. Uh, no, you need right. to keep your investments in real investments. And then when you die, your wife will get the investments. And, uh, and if you want to supplement the level of net worth that you have, uh, should you die, you can do that with some term life insurance for a short period of time. How old are you? I'm 58. 58. Okay. So when you're 65, you're going to have $1.4 million in investments, assuming your money is invested in decent growth stock mutual funds. Yes. It'll double about every seven years. When you're 72, uh, you'll have uh, uh, 2.8, almost $3 million in investments. How's your health? My health is good. Good. Okay. How old is your wife? She's uh, two years older than me. She'll be 60 in a couple months. Okay. So what we're doing is we're saying if your pension disappears right. because, because you died, What does your wife need that your net worth does not now provide? And so $700,000 would create maybe $60,000 or $70,000 worth of income um, if something happened to you. What's your income today? I'm retired. I'm just just collecting my pension of uh, $30,000 and about $4,000. Okay. Just under four thousand, okay. and that's why I could take the whole thing at fifty three. Yep. But if I die, yep. I would, she would get nothing. Yep. And we're both in good health. It's just a matter yep. of playing the odds. Yep. I'm taking the fifty three, and if you want to play an, if you want to play a math game, you invest the difference in that in thirty nine hundred, and you buy term life insurance out of some of that difference, and you will come out with a lot more than this goob is offering you with this horrible policy. Hmm. Yeah, long term care rider. I wouldn't need it. No, you don't need a long term care rider. If you want, if you don't tie long term care into life insurance, it's a gimmick and they overcharge for it. If you need long term care, just go to an insurance broker and get long term care insurance. Right. Okay. I figured I would have enough with with my 
my uh, retirement. So here's the thing. If you go into a nursing thing. home, are you going to burn through this nest egg and leave her with nothing? If the answer is yes, you need long-term care insurance If the or, or, or leave her with not enough. So mm-hmm. since you're concerned about it, I might buy a half million dollars in um, life insurance, term life insurance for five years or 10 years. Something like that. If you're in good health, it's not going to be that expensive. And at 60, I would buy some long-term care insurance. But in the meantime, I'm not. Here's a good rule. Here's a good rule. Here's a good rule. Never use a life insurance policy as an investment vehicle. 100% of those suck mathematically. 100%. It's kind of like saying never do payday lending, Ken. It's like saying Never, there is never a case where leasing a car makes sense. That's right. There is never a case where going into debt at 18% interest on a credit card makes sense. There's not one. You're not the exception, Snowflake. These are all stupid things. They go in one bucket, the stupid bucket. And just never, 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 never do that. So thank you for calling. I'm glad you called. Hopefully I helped you avoid a hundreds of thousands of dollars mistake here. I would keep the full pension. And if you want to buy a little bit of term and later on buy some long-term care insurance, that's what I would do. As separate policies, never bundled. Yeah, I think what you laid out for him is actually alleviating all of his concerns. And they're not bad financial decisions. He's healthy at 58. You said seven years from now, he's going to double. So if he gets it to 65, I mean, he's got everything taken care of. And they're in good financial shape. I think they're clearly living below their means anyway. Oh, they've done a great job. They're millionaires. They're millionaires. Yeah. So here's the thing. On both of those insurance policies, insurance is what you buy for one reason only, to cover something you can't cover yourself. Mm -hmm. So if you're broke, stone cold broke, and you have a $5,000 car, you need to cover carry insurance on that $5,000 car collision because that car being totaled is a catastrophic financial event because you're broke. If you've got $350,000 cash in your checking account and you're driving a $20,000 car and you don't want to carry collision you can afford to write the check to replace a stupid car Mm -hmm. so that's an that's an event you can choose to insure or not to insure so with your case here's the thing long-term care insurance is this the average nursing home care stay is 2.3 years average cost right now is about 95,000 a year so we're talking about somewhere around 250,000 dollars so if you have four million dollars you don't need long-term care insurance on average, you're going to go through 250000 for your care. Mama's going to be just fine when you die, uh, financially speaking. I'm sure she'll cry, but financially speaking. <laughs> Glad my you my wife that is out. actually planning my death, and it's got me very concerned. Oh, Y'all, I just God, need to say that out loud in front of everybody. Oh, no, Sharon loves Dave. We've been, we've been married almost 40 years, and all of my estate plan <laughs> is predicating on me predeceasing her, and I don't know how she knows that. So that, that's bothersome. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, so yeah, the same thing with long-term care. The other thing is, so in his case, if he wanted to, if she's okay with 700000 yeah. to cover nursing home and or cover death, him and loss of income, they don't need any insurance. Correct. If she's okay with that. I think they might be a little slim emotionally. I'd probably beef it up because it doesn't cost that much. I would. For a short period yeah. of time. This is The Ramsey Show. Chaos. That's what it can feel like when your business is growing so fast you've outgrown your financial and accounting software. The faster you grow, the more likely you are to lose control of the numbers. And here's the reality. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's why we use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. Over 28,000 companies use NetSuite by Oracle, including Ramsey Solutions, because NetSuite gives us a single view of everything we need to make daily decisions. Whether you're making a few million to hundreds of millions a year, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of the things you need to grow, like your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, all in one dashboard. Go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey right now to get their free white paper. Jumpstart your CFO career.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host. Thank you for joining us, America. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Chris is in Springfield, Missouri. Hey, Chris, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave. This is an honor to be on the show here. Well, thank you. How can we help? I got, I, I want to know your opinion on, uh, okay, I bought at my first house last summer. Uh, me and a couple of friends renovated it. Uh, according to my realtor, we increased the value by about 50 grand. And I have some aspirations to become a small time landlord. I was wondering if it's a totally dumb idea to get a HELOC on my current house for a down payment for a second house and turn the first one into an Airbnb or a rental. Yeah. Chris, how old are you? 26. Good for you. Cool. And what do you do for a living? I'm a plumber. Good. Okay. So when you say we did this renovation, do we own the house or you own the house and your friends helped you with renovation? I own the house and, and they helped. Okay. Yes. So it's completely in your name. Yes. And the house is worth how much? Uh, roughly 160 Mm-hmm. after the fact. Mm-hmm. And so you think you could sell it for um, 160 and you owe like 110 I owe about 100 grand. About 100 yeah. on it. Okay, so you got about 60 equity minus expenses. All right, cool. All right. Yeah. Well, in, in fairness, uh, as I answer the question, when I was, uh, to, to tell you who's answering the question, when I was uh, 23, 24 years old, I started buying and selling real estate using the nothing down real estate techniques that were promising back 35 years ago. They're the same ones that are out there floating around today telling you to buy real estate and get rich in real estate. And so I didn't have any money. I started buying real estate. I started borrowing all the money to buy all the real estate. Um, I got rich. By the time I was your age at 26, I had $4 million worth of real estate starting from nothing. And I had over a million dollar net worth. Uh, the problem was I had no idea the influence of debt on that situation. And I was flipping houses. That's what I was doing. I was fixing them and flipping them. Um, I actually hired crews to do it. I know how to swing a hammer, but I was choosing to do more volume than my hammer would do by itself. And so I just would set up a crew or hire a painter or hire a plumber or whatever to get the different rehab things done on the houses I was fixing and flipping. Some of them I was holding as rentals. And so I tell you all of that to tell you, I aspired at that time to do what you aspire to do now. It's what I wanted to be. and It's what you want to be. Fair enough. What happened was the bank got sold that I was dealing with to another bank, and they looked over and saw that they they felt like this 26-year-old kid owed them too much money, and they called our notes. And we spent the next two and a half years of our life fighting through severe banking technicalities that I didn't even know existed and losing everything that we owned. We were sued, we were foreclosed on, and finally we were bankrupt. Um, at the bottom of that, I started studying how money works. And I started talking to old rich people. I didn't want to talk to young rich people. I had been him. I didn't want his advice. It didn't work. And old rich people started telling me this thing called common sense. And as a Christian, I started studying the Bible, and it talks negatively about debt 100% of the time. And so I figured out that this debt thing didn't work, and I started buying my – I bought my first piece of real estate after that with cash. It took me a little while because it's hard to get the cash together. And you made some quick, right. e you made some quick, easy money, plus or minus your sweat in this house. But it's been fairly quick, and it feels like you could do it all the time. Well, I did it a lot. I did it a lot. But it still came crashing down around my ears. So that's the guy you're talking to. He not only wanted sure. to do what you're talking about, but he did it, and I did it with debt, and it backfired on me. And it wasn't that I was right. stupid. It was that debt is stupid. And so all of that to answer your question and say, no, I would not borrow on a HELOC to go buy a rental. Uh, I would keep working like a crazy man as a plumber. I'd get this house paid off if you're going to live in it. Um, or I would sell it and take 50000 60000 and buy a tiny little cheap something and flip it with cash. And if you want to do some flips with cash, I'm in. 
I'm fine with that, especially where you're swinging a hammer and some of your buddies are doing the renovation with you and that kind of stuff. That's all cool. But I'll tell you now, I own, that was 35 years ago that we crashed, 30 years ago that we crashed, 35 years ago that story started. And uh, today I own several hundred million dollars in real estate. The building I'm sitting in is worth a hundred million. And so, uh, and it's all paid for 100%. I do not borrow money for anything ever after that experience so i tell you a big long story to give you a really solid no don't do that (laughs) yeah you know i love the point you make he's a young guy and if he's not living in that house flip that and and get your apartment yes sir i don't mind you renting and flipping sir but pay cash that's right pay cash he's off to a good start there if he flips that now yeah and it's good time to make a little money if you can get in one at a deal very difficult to find a deal right now yeah like um, almost impossible needle in a haystack. Yeah, I was but, shocked at how how much that house costs. Yeah, but um, but you can do that, and it, it's possible in Springfield, Missouri. I mean, that's a it's a great market, and I uh, I want you to go live your dream. I don't want you to let it turn into a nightmare, and it has for me. Oh, and by the way, there was a whole bunch of people did nothing down real estate. Then I was actually in a nothing down real estate club back then, Chris, that had 150 members. Let me tell you how many of those guys are still doing real estate deals with nothing down. Zero. Let me tell you how many of those guys went broke. All of us. All of us. All of us went broke. No one made it out using that technique. Now, I do know one guy started selling the properties off, taking the equities and paying off the others. He ended up with a portfolio about one-third the size of his original Mm -hmm. portfolio, downgraded by 70%, but turned out with cash. He went the other way from the nothing down to 100% debt-free, and he's still managing those properties I ran into him the other day. But the guys that persisted with this nothing down bullcrap stuff that sold in these weekend seminars, 100% failure rate. A decade later, two decades later. So I I want to stay there, Dave, because it's still being sold and it's being glamorized on social media. Oh, big time. So what's what are they not telling them? They're they're telling you, oh, you can do all this. this." But there's something they're not telling them. They're not properly portraying the risk. What's the what's the hidden information they're not sharing? The, The nothing down deal only works if everything goes perfect and nothing ever goes perfect. That's it. Risk. Debt equals risk. More debt equals more risk. If you owe $100,000 on, on something, that's a lot more risk than if you owe $1,000 on that thing. So more debt equals more risk 100% of the time because you got to carry it if it doesn't sell. Mm. you got to carry it if the Fed decides to jack up rates. Oh, wait, that happened. you got to carry it if there's a pandemic. Oh, wait, that happened. you got to carry it even if you lose your job because of the pandemic. Oh, you got to carry it even if there's hyperinflation so it freezes the market like a deer in the headlights. Oh, these are real freaking things that happen. And they happen to me. You got to carry it if the president changes the tax legislation and changes and flips all investment property on its head. Ronald Reagan completely destroyed the real estate market while I was in the middle of it. I'm a Ronald Reagan fan, but worst presidential decision he made completely undid the investment real estate market by flipping the uh, flipping the uh, depreciation schedules off changing the value of real estate with one stroke of the pen and it turned it turned the snl business on its head back then the savings and loan industry and, and you can't control that crap because you're not the president and it it affects things out of your control come in and uh, and make you stupid when it's stress tested always reveals itself to be stupid you can tell it was skinny dipping when the tide goes out oh that's what they don't know Look, I love real estate and I want you to have a house, but I don't want a house to have you. That's why you need to get in touch with Churchill Mortgage to make sure you do this right. These guys are awesome. They'll help you get on a smarter mortgage plan because they're committed to doing what's right for you. 
That means they check in every year with free consultations to help you stay on the right plan. They show you how to save money and interest so you can build wealth faster. They walk you through the total cost of your loan so you can make the best choice. Basically, they care. That's why we call them Ramsey Trusted. You can achieve debt-free home ownership, and Churchill is here to help. Go to their site, churchillmortgage.com slash Ramsey, to start your approval or get more information. Thank you for joining us, America. One of the most important types of insurance you have is, of course, car insurance. It's actually the law. Maybe even motorcycle insurance, if that's your thing. Most Americans don't have enough car insurance, and you're probably one of them. If you get into an accident, you don't have enough insurance. You'll have to pay for your own car repairs, medical bills, the other driver's car repairs, and their medical bills, and their passenger's medical bills. It can cost you thousands and thousands of dollars, even get you sued. You've got to have the right car insurance, and that's why we created a network of endorsed local providers, or ELPs. They're licensed independent insurance agents, which means they will shop around and get you the best deal among a bunch of different companies and get you the coverage that you actually need. Hello. They'll teach you how to understand your car insurance. A lot of people pay for car insurance, just mad about it, don't even know what they got. You need to uh, actually understand what your freaking money is going to. Yeah. If you're ready to work with an insurance agent who actually works for you, not for the insurance company, visit RamseySolutions.com slash auto to connect with a Ramsey trusted ELP. RamseySolutions.com slash auto. Eduardo is with us in Los Angeles. Hey, Eduardo, what's up? Hi, thank you guys for taking my call. Sure. How can we help? Yeah, uh, my question is uh, to Ken today. I um, it's about a career advice. I am um, looking into getting into college, um, and so I am pretty clear on what I want to study. Um, and I always hear him talk about the Bethel Tech School of Technology. Um, and I just need some advice. If you know, since college right now is starting to become more irrelevant for a degree. And so I don't know. So what direction um, do you want to go? You said you knew what you want to study. Presumably, yeah. you know why you want to study that. Where do you want to go? I want I want to get into engineering, software engineering, computer science space. Yeah. Well, specifically, what would that look like? Your first entry level. Uh, what's that going to look like? You know the industry well enough to know what entry level work is going to be. Um, mostly it's the coding. Gotcha. And. Yeah, so um, here's the answer. Uh, computer science degrees or many computer degrees, uh, they're never going to ROI for you uh, based on the fact that you want to go into developing and coding. Uh, you don't need to do that. Bethel Tech, obviously, they, they are a, a, a big time partner of the Ken Coleman Show. In fact, we just got an email this last week. Um, the first Ken Coleman show grad to, to get a job making over hundred grand just happened. Um, and he is a recent graduate of their nine week program. That's one example. There are a lot of other coding boot camps. You need to do your homework on reputable boot camps. you know, call Bethel Tech, but talk to other folks. Do your homework because the reality is uh, to get a four year degree and in some places that can be as much as $180,000 uh, for some computer science degrees, it just does not ROI. You do not need it. Google has announced a major initiative where they are training future developers, future engineers, because they know that they can teach people what they need to be able to work for Google. And so uh, it does not require a college degree not to go the direction you want to go. And so uh, less time, less money is what you're looking for here. And so don't feel the trap that I have to go to college to become a developer. Yeah, um, Eduardo, we've got at Ramsey Solutions, we have uh, software engineers, uh, 
dev ones, twos, threes. Uh, we've got architect and platform people uh, all in the space that you're talking about. Totals over 400 folks working on my team. I pay millions and millions of dollars a year in salary and income to people like you want to be. And I would, I, I'll just tell you, 100%, we do not require a four-year degree to enter that field. 100%, if you were going to hire you to do code, to be a software engineer, to, to write Java, to write uh, Ruby, whatever it is you're going to write, uh, all we want to know is can you do it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to run a code test on you, and if you can code, we're going to bring you in. And the level you code at uh, is the level we're going to pay you at, not what you think you are, whether you think you're a dev one or you think you're a dev two. Our guys, we've got, you know, professional executive leadership in this area that hire people every day. I will hire probably 60 or 70 people in the coming 12 months in the field you're talking about, and we will not require a four-year degree from a single one of them. Uh, all we want to know is can you code? All we know want to know is the background that if you have any if you have any experience that proves you can code, uh, if you can pass the test showing you can code, if you have the certifications from something like Bethel Tech or Microsoft or whoever showing you know how to run the technology, then you're in. Uh, technology is not driven by that. The only time you would get a four-year information systems or computer science degree is if you're going to want to go into a very high level of leadership where the actual coding doesn't matter because by the time you get a four years if, if you're graduating today with a four-year degree the stuff you have studied in college is already obsolete because it changes almost by the minute yeah what they, what they need to study uh, and so being in the field having your hands in the code makes you much more valuable oh and by the way that's four years of income making a hundred thousand dollars that you're missing out on too yeah not only are you going to pay somebody 180 grand so this is a five or six hundred thousand dollar conversation we're having right here yeah and listen i believe in four-year degrees if you if you ask me if you need to go get a four-year degree in marketing i would say yeah or a four-year degree in business or accounting i'd say yeah go do it I think it's worth it. There's going to be some superfluous classes in there, yeah. but it's worth it. You'll get an ROI on that. It makes sense. It's it and it, you know, and it's going to give you literal lift. Uh, but I got to tell you, you come in here to interview. You got a four-year degree in information systems, yeah. or you got three years of code experience as a software engineer. I'll take the code experience over the four-year degree 100% of the time. Yeah. Now the, we're going to interview the rest of the person and learn about them too. We're not going to yeah. rule out the guy with a four-year degree. Right. We're not calling you an idiot for having one. But I'm just saying, it does not even give you a one-up. No, and, and and let me also give an alternate path for leadership in this space too, because I've seen it happen here at Ramsey Solutions. It's happening all the time where we'll have somebody come in uh, as a coder and they do great work. Uh, we realize they've got great people skills or otherwise known as soft skills. You hear this in the marketplace all the time, and and they because they follow well, they get the opportunity to lead. And so you could you could go to a boot camp, a Bethel Tech like this, get in, do a good job, listen to the Entree Leadership Podcast, buy the Entree leadership best-selling book written by Dave how do we lead how do we teach leadership here at Ramsey Solutions and begin to follow well and work your way up the leadership ladder as well it is possible so the long and the short is Eduardo go to code school don't go to don't go years. to college not for this particular yeah, path not for this path yeah doctor I, I, I yes wouldn't. I wouldn't if you were my no. son I would tell you not no to. And so, and then when you graduate from code school, take a dev one position and keep going to code school. This is the key. It's a very important point. Just because you come out with this, with this qualification. You're not a dev three when you come yes, out of code take school. Take the entry level position. The young man I was talking about, Dave, he was in a non uh, technology position making $60,000. He just got a $100,000 entry level position. As a Dev 1, Dev code, one, on code school on, only under his belt. With a nine-week program at Bethel yep. Tech, which, by the way, Ramsey Solutions, because we pay cash, our, our audience, you're going to get it for less than 15 grand. Yeah. So well, that's it, not an ad for them. You could go anywhere no. at code school. Well, you, I you tell people, choose, check everybody out. You can choose them. They're, they're great. We wouldn't endorse them if we didn't that's think they're right. great. But It's everywhere. They're, 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 you know, our guys all the time, I mean, we even talked about opening a code school. Yeah. Just because we're, our need is so high, yeah. and really, that's all they need to know how to do to get in to get their foot in the door, and then they can grow from there, and we can teach them the rest on the job in an apprenticeship type situation. Because right. our Dev threes coach our Dev ones that's every right. day; they write code together. Oh yeah, and they'll pull them up and teach them. And so that's that's how you learn this particular thing. It's it's like a modern day version of a trade like welding or mm -hmm. pipe fitting. And I'll tell you this, Dave, the industry, the data is out there on this. If you are one of these, you know, brilliant developers and you've got good people skills, 
There's no stopping you. Yeah, because I'll, most developers don't. They say it, point blank. No, but... they don't have people skills. They're, <laughs> that's not what they do. That's right. Most of them are, you know, game on with the, with the ones and <laughs> that's zeros. Right. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's a great space, though, dude. And I got a bunch of them on the team, and we love them. We love them. They're great people, and uh, they care very deeply about their work. They're wonderful. We, we, it's a great interaction we have here at Ramsey with them. This is The Ramsey Show. Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host. This is the Ramsey Show. Jacob is with us in Seattle. Hi, Jacob. How are you? I'm doing well, Dave. Ken, thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. Sure. What's up? All right. So um, me and my wife uh, are currently, have no doubt, uh, looking to purchase a house in the upcoming couple years. We have a little bit of a disagreement on how we are going to be saving the money. Um, I'm uh, I have a higher risk appetite than she does. I would like to put it into like a diversified ETFs and try to get a little, try to get the money to work for us for the upcoming few years before we purchase. And she would like to put it into a high yield savings account so we know exactly where we're going to be mm-hmm. in three years. Okay. Um, how would you suggest to go about finding a compromise with that? Well, I think what you both need to realize is that this decision is not going to keep you from buying a house or yes. cause you to be able to buy a house. So let's do the math for a second. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. How much are you talking about saving? Um, we would like, I would like to purchase a house that we're going to be in for the next 30, 40, basically our lifetime. So good luck um, with that. But probably, yeah, it usually doesn't work that yeah. way. But, but how much um, are you talking about saving to- in the next three years? Uh, about 200000 Okay. And so if you make 10% on this money, you're going to make 20000 bucks. If you put it in a high-yield savings, you're going to make nothing, and you'll lose 20000 bucks. But 200000 is what's going to cause you to be able to buy the house, and what, 220 is not going to cause you to buy a substantially different house. So the fact that you made a little money on your money is more of an intellectual exercise than a factual change in your situation. Okay, that makes sense. I'm following you. Okay, and so, uh, and, and the same thing's true with her. Let's say you put it into an ETF and it did not make 10% a year. You had a bad three-year run in the stock market. Stock market in general was down. You got tagged, you know, in the face with this thing, which could happen in a three-year swing. And uh, you don't have 200000 You end up with 180000 so you actually lost money. You follow me? Still didn't keep you from buying yeah. a house. So my point is your concern that you're not making a bunch of money is somewhat mathematically invalid. Her concern that you're going to lose so much that you're going to not be able to get a house is also not really mathematically valid. This is all more about emotion than it is actual dollars. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm following you. Yeah. So anyway, all that to say, how do we solve this? Um Probably at our house, uh, we'd probably end up splitting the baby. We'd probably get let me do uh, put a hundred thousand over in investments, and she'd put a hundred thousand over there. And at the end, we would see who won the bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you would say, put it, do a fifty-fifty down the middle. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. Because, but again, before you do this, both of you need to really own the fact that this is not going to cause you to buy a house or not buy a house. It's just more of an argument over how we park the money. So I, I got to weigh in here. Uh, you know, look, I, I think you do exactly what Dave just laid out. Walk her through that, both sides of the coin. Then I would see how she's reacting to that. And if her safety 
gland is still flaring, oh, I'm I, going with mama. You know what? I'm happy just, wife, happy life. Well, that's the other alternative. That's the other alternative. Yeah, you don't lose on that one. <laughs> because if right. you win, if you put it yeah. all in there and you go down 30 grand, I told you that's so. going to cost Woo. you 30 years yeah. of remembering that. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. And it maybe some jewelry. It's going to cost you $1,000 yeah. a year in memory. That's my take. You remember back in oh. all 23 when you didn't do what I said do? Oh, I remember, the this is, they have memories. Oh. oh, they have memories like elephants. Elephants have nothing on women. Yeah, this is true. They remember forever. Yeah. I, Especially. Especially when they're right. That's even more devastating. Which, again, if you want to Which be Which is married, most of the time, actually. Well, that, that's what you need to come to that conclusion yeah. as well. So this is not even a mathematical Who question at all. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her yes. worth is far above rubies. The yep. heart of her husband safely trusts her, yep. and he will have no lack of gain. So at our house, we probably, today we would split the baby. 20 years ago, when we were still a little fresher, the, the, the nerves were still a little more raw after going broke. Yeah. We probably would have parked it yeah. in a high yield savings yeah. and we're not taking any risk because Sharon was so terrorized yes. emotionally by what we went through that it took a decade for her to go. And we had to have a big old pile of money to where she could go, oh, if you screw yeah. that up over there, it ain't going to kill and us. And she's still one of the most frugal people I know. Oh, my God. The it's woman will pick up an old used golf ball right. like no one I have ever seen. <laughs> we have a collection of old used golf she's balls. She's over the weeds picking is up. Un- she's going to get bit by a snake <laughs> getting, a, getting a golf ball that's worth 50 oh, cents gosh. because it's already been hit by the mower. Yeah. It's unbelievable. The yeah. woman is, oh, gosh. Yeah. Yes, she, no, frugal, frugal, don't even touch it. Yeah. All right, and and, and that's a compliment, my oh, darling. it's a total compliment. It's a compliment, my darling. Eric's in New York City. Hey, Eric, what's up? How you doing, Dave? Better than I deserve, man. How can I help? Yes, um, I uh, have credit card debt about twenty five thousand, and two of them total twenty thousand. My credit union is offering a one point nine nine percent to, and I was thinking about refinancing it. Uh, those two larger debts because it's about four hundred dollars in interest that I'm paying every single month while I'm doing the baby steps. I'm on baby step one. So you and, owe uh, you owe just, you owe forty thousand dollars on plastic. No, I owe twenty five thousand on plastic. Oh, twenty five thousand. Right, and two of them total twenty. I got you. Okay, and, and you're gonna you're gonna refinance two, twenty of the twenty five. Right. Okay. And uh, I. What I do you make a year? Debt- 100. Okay. A little over 100. You know, it's odd. This is the same conversation we were just having a minute ago, but he, he was on the investing side and you're on the debt side. You can do this mm-hmm. if you want to do it. Here's the danger. You're going to think you actually did something. You think this is a big mm-hmm. deal. You don't have a $400 problem, my man. You have a $25,000 problem. When you address the $25,000 problem with the idiocy spending you've been doing like you've been in Congress on plastic, when you address that deep down in your soul, you're going to get out of debt really, really fast on $25,000, making $100,000. you are not going to be in debt very long. Interest is not your problem. But if you want to lower the interest, it'll help you a tiny bit. Here's the deal. 5% 5% of you getting out of debt is refinancing this. 95% of you getting out of debt is you looking in the mirror and getting pissed off and chunking on this thing and beating the snot out of it because mathematically 95% of this is not going to be an interest problem. Mathematically, this is going to be you chunking money on this because you're mad, you're sick and tired, of being sick and tired. I'm not living like this anymore. Uh, you are 95% of the secret sauce. That that level of, ah, you hearing me, dude? Yes. So how long would it take if I just left it? Two months longer. Ooh. You saved okay. two months. I might have missed that by a few days one way or another. But my, my point is $400 is $4,800 a year. And you're going to be out of debt in a year. And so... 
uh, you know, we cut it in half because halfway through the year, you're going to have the debt half paid down. So it's not 4800 a year you're going to save. It's going to be more like 2400 a year in this year that you get out of debt in one year. And, and so you're saving 2400 bucks, 200 bucks a month at the end of the day. And how fast does, how much does that apply to a 2500 Oh, I was right. It's 10%. There we go. Look at that. So, yeah, you know, so it's probably, it's between a month and two months you're going to save. It's okay to do it. I'm not mad about you doing it. But what I don't want you to do, Eric, the thing people do with debt consolidation is they feel like they did something and they think they fixed it with this loan and you cannot borrow your way out of debt. Yeah, I mean, it, they, that's what they're selling is saving money. And then you kind of lean on that instead of the intensity that you're talking well, and about. And you, you have this frustration like, i got to get out of debt. And then you think you did something. And then you look up a year later and you're still in exactly the same place. I got a line. With lower Dave. payments. You gave me a line. What's that? He doesn't have an interest problem. He has an intensity problem. Ooh. That's, that's what you're line. teaching. That's a good line. Oh, you gave it to me. Oh, I, well, I didn't say it. You said it. I'll, I'll, I'll let you have it. Taking notes over here, folks. You can own it. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Get your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from The Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts. about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today as we talk about your money, your job, your career, your mental wellness, your relationships, your life right here on the show. 888-825-5225 is the number. Columbia, Missouri starts off this hour. OB is with us. Hi, OB. What's up? Hi, Dave. Hi, Ken. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. How can we help? Well, I uh, just want to start by saying that uh, we're debt-free, uh, paid off our home mortgage uh, late last year, and we're hoping to get on the debt-free stage in one of these days. Great. How can we help? Well, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one, I received a letter uh, from my 401k plan, and it says that uh, the IRS service requires plans to pass non-discrimination tests each plan year. And it says uh, the test place percentage limits on the amount of a, a amount a highly compensated employee may contribute and have allocated to their 401k. So basically, it gave me some money back saying that I over contributed mm-hmm. uh, because I uh, guess some people in the company are not contributing to their 401k. Correct. Um, so I guess my question is uh, does the IRS set this limit? Or can a company decide what they consider as highly compensated employee? No, there's a formula. Fact- the IRS sets a formula. It's a regulation in the 401k regulations that say uh, it keeps all the big bosses from making a pile of money and dumping it in where the little guy's not putting any money in. And the big boss is just using the 401k to screw over the little guy. And that's what it's for. <laughs> that's why it's there. Uh, but it, the the math you know, you know can really work out big time against you so you are in the highly compensated category and uh and so that means that you do not have enough participation with the uh folks that are not highly compensated in the 401k that are medium whatever how big a company is this it's a family-owned home improvement retail store got about over 300 stores so what 5,000 employees? Uh, probably more. Uh, okay. The, the place where I work has about uh, 177 people. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah, you're just li- you're just limited. It's that simple. You don't have any control over the situation, and the guideline is not it's not arbitrary. It's not set by the company. It is a formula that the IRS regs hit. And basically, what you're telling me is this retail operation, and so you got a lot of turnover at the entry level position, so they don't ever bother with the 401k. A lot of them working part time jobs, that kind of stuff, and so it's going to keep this thing screwed up. One antidote is for them to bring in something like our smart dollar classes, where you teach the employees how to handle money, get them out of debt, so they start their 401ks at any level, uh, and we've got companies your size and companies small and large all across America that are doing it. For instance, Costco, all of their employees have gone through our smart dollar. And so they, you know, and it's basically the Financial Peace University type lessons on getting on a budget, getting out of debt, and that enables people to begin investing then and shows them the importance of investing. And so it's really a very cool thing. So you could talk to them about, talk to your leadership team about bringing in something like Smart Dollar because education and getting people out of debt so that they can invest is the answer to the formula long term. But that's probably a two to a three year process to get this to where you still, where you'll pass the non discrimination tests. And the discrimination is not racial or, or uh, sex discrimination, the discrimination is math discrimination. It's high income earners are discriminating against low income earners or medium income earners is the concept. That's what the, the word means in this context. I also want to point out, Dave, that recent studies show that employees want financial advice and guidance from their employer. That's something they're looking for. So what you've got here is also a tremendous benefit for companies like this, not just to um, help the individual in that situation, but to keep people staying with them longer. You're going to build loyalty. It's a real perk. And uh, a lot of individuals, I mean, you have to understand if, 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 a, if an employee looks at their employer and says, you help me get my money life in order, um, they're going to be happier, they're going to be more effective at work, and they're likely to stay with you much longer. This is a straight-up benefit that people are looking for, and Smart Dollar is poised to be able to help right now. Yeah, I we, mean, we, were the, we were the first ones in the financial first wellness there. space. I own financialwellness.com. So we were the first ones there, and teaching companies, uh, setting companies up to be able to teach their team how to handle money, whether it's got five people or 5,000 people or 50,000 people. But I got to tell you, Ken, it's fun when I go to my local Costco over here and I walk through and uh, the guy or gal checking out my stuff is like seeing the videos. Like, hey, Dave, what's going on, man? Thank you, man. <laughs> yes, that's, that's pretty great. cool. That's, that's pretty great. cool. I get recognized sometimes at different places, but that one feels pretty good. Do they ever follow it up with, really, Dave? You really need that many ribs? You really? You really? Dave, you really <laughs> need that much water. Seven cases of water. I'm going to Lake House. I'm going to Lake House. Leave that's me alone. Great. All right, here we go. Seven <laughs> gallons of peanut butter. Amanda's with us in Minneapolis. Hi, Amanda. How are you? Hi Dave, thanks for taking my call. Sure, what's um, up? I, I'll try to keep I'll try to keep it brief. Um, with the housing market going on, my husband and I have about two hundred eighty five thousand dollars in equity in our home. We've always done the work ourselves, so our house is kind of ballooned, and we've never pulled equity from it. So we carry very little debt. Um, after we would pay our debt off, we would have roughly one hundred forty four thousand left over. We're just trying to figure out if it makes sense to sell. We're in a good financial position. We own an electrical company. We make good money. So we really don't need to sell. But my husband's really entranced by the idea of putting a lot of money into savings and buying our next house with pure cash. What would you advise? Hmm. I, you know, and, if, you're, if your net result is that the two of you can find a home that you like as much and you end up with right. zero mortgage, and you've taken advantage of this white-hot market, and it causes you to be able to do that, that's okay. If the end result that- is that you end up in a house you don't like because your husband got all flipped out about this real estate market, that is not a good result. Right, and that's my worry. Um, we do yep. own some commercial properties. He wants to, for a couple of years, live in one of the commercial properties, nope. which I'm not completely sold on. Nope. And Nope. It's just, nope. yeah, we'd have to go back into renting for a nope. couple of years because, yeah. So. Nope. You're not broke. <laughs> You're not broke. Right. He's just going too hard. Tell him to dial it back a notch. You're going to make plenty okay. of money. You're going to have plenty of money. You've already made plenty of money. And this house is going right. to do nothing but go up in value from here. You don't need to live in a warehouse. 
so he can take <laughs> advantage of the market. Nope. Right. I got to tell you, Sharon Ramsey's not doing that crap. Yeah. It ain't happening. And I, I love, I mean, I like taking advantage of a hot market. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that idea. But this guy, he's just pushing it over the edge, and it's going to cost him back down the road later. Nope. Nope. He may be debt free, but he'll be sleeping on the couch. In a warehouse. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> down by the river. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Ramsey Show. Life is full of firsts. As the first and longest serving Christian health cost sharing ministry, CHM has shared medical expenses for its members since 1981. We believe you should have the freedom to focus on your health while being supported by a community of believers, giving you the opportunity to create many more firsts. Thirty years, we've walked with millions of people and their families to help them work and overcome their financial stress. Money stress is one of many kinds of stress all of us experience. People struggle with anxiety, with loneliness, with stress, with mental wellness all the time. And here's the good news. Dr. John Deloney has a new book available for pre-order called Own Your Past, Change Your Future. It is selling like crazy. I just got the sales report on it a minute ago. It's a pre-sale right now. It's going crazy. It comes out in April, and if you pre-order Own Your Past, Change Your Future, you are going to get a free bonus, which includes the audiobook, the ebook, and a month of free one-on-one -on -one weekly therapy through our partners at BetterHelp. This is a real bargain for $20. Own Your Past, Change Your Future for $20. You do need to get his new book. It is incredible at RamseySolutions.com. Pre-order it so you get all the bargains. Blinds.com is our question of the day. Find out for yourself why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Free samples, free shipping, and with the new promos they run every month, you'll save even more. Use the promo code RAMSEY to get the best possible deal. Today's question comes from Laura in Florida. I am studying interior design and I have been doing some work for free for a friend who is already a designer to get experience. Recently, she asked me to take on some time intensive projects. I would like to be paid for these projects, but am unsure how to ask since I have been doing other work for free. How do I ask to be paid for these larger projects? Well, the simple answer is clearly and nicely right with a with a good helping of humility here the challenge is is uh, uh you started out working for free which i want to first say dave a lot of people uh in today's environment and i'm not going to go on a rant here but they they just look down their nose at getting themselves in by working for free and it's all about i deserve the dignity of being paid and and this is the way the world works so i applaud laura for getting in and doing some work for free. But now the friend who has said, okay, we got some new projects. Um, I think you have to sit down and go, hey, I'm so grateful that you allowed me this opportunity to Always shadow you. Always lead with gratitude. Always gratitude. Always lead with gratitude. Grateful for this. Uh, it has been invaluable to me. These projects seem to be a lot more time intensive. And because of that, I'm wondering, can you pay? And what could you pay me for these? Because this is going to eat into the other areas of your life. And this is what I mean by clearly. Don't speak in gray, black and white. So that and don't your whine friend understands. about it and beat around the edges. 
yeah, cut straight direct through to it. it. Here's how it's going to affect my life for these time-intensive projects. Could you pay me? Notice how I'm stating this. Could you pay me? And what would you be willing to pay me? And we have a conversation, not a negotiation. Now, this is a friend yeah. who's already done you a real solid. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if you go that direction and that kind of posture, and when I say posture, I, I don't mean the physical posture. I mean the emotional. I think if you do it the right way, uh, your friend's going to let you know what she can or can't do. And then you have to be a big girl and decide what you can and can't do. Here's the thing. Anytime any of us are in a conversation with someone, that is uncomfortable or awkward we tend to in the name of being nice do a ballroom dance all around the issue instead of just saying what it is that's right it is a lot less painful and kinder to be just cut straight through it and very calm lower your voice tone your volume everything and just say what it is uh, I mean, whatever the situation is, just say it. Yeah. And it, it takes the air out of the room. And it, and otherwise, all this ballroom dancing adds to the awkwardness. And I, I did this. And, and you guys would think, well, Dave's always blunt. Well, you know what? I've gotten more blunt. I've gotten more direct because of this idea. And because early on in our career, you know, we had folks working on the team. We had maybe a team of 20 people or something like that. Someone would be screwing around. They wouldn't be doing their work. They'd be off track or they weren't good at it or whatever. And I would get continually frustrated and they never knew it. Mm. Because in the name of being nice, I never told them Mm -hmm. that they sucked at what they were doing. Right. And it it wasn't nice because I got more and more and more frustrated until finally – then, then I would, I, there would be a, th- I wasn't ever mean to somebody, but I, I would be like this one little thing and I would hit, I'd hit this little number one with a 10 and, and they're going, where'd that come from? Well, it came from six months of me putting up with you, not doing it. And, and, but I never said anything cause I was nice. That's the key. If and we, that's just BS to be unclear yeah. is to be unkind. Right. And here's the deal. If we don't fill in the blanks for people, they'll fill them in for us. And therein lies the frustration. Well, you start doing a ballroom dance, they're going to think it's worse than it is. (laughs) That's the other thing. They're trying to read your mind. You're trying to read theirs. And it just gets into this weird thing versus this is a friend. This is an easy conversation. I know where Laura's coming from. Yep. It feels like there's but a lot of... But reframe this. Just yeah. reframe it. All it is is you did some part-time work for free, yeah. and it's over. That's it. Yeah. Just a, it's uh, her oh, option. And, oh, and there's another chance here to do some more work, That's but it's right. not going to be free. That's right. You just need to go, thanks for all the... Thanks for letting me come in here and learn this stuff. And, yeah. hey, I'm not going to be able to work on this st- other stuff unless there's pay involved because it's it's just too much. And But thanks so much for letting me do this. Lead with gratitude. Close with gratitude. Uh, make a gratitude sandwich, man. Yeah. I mean, and by the way, the backside of this, folks, if Laura goes in with that posture and she's been tremendously valuable to her friend and her friend realizes she's not working for free anymore, great chance that she scraps some money together to hire Laura. So going in free and adding tremendous value, you never know what that could lead to. I'll give you a 50 50 chance. One was thinking about paying her anyway. I think so. I mean, you know, she's yeah. at, she, she, you know, unless she's just trying to take advantage of her. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cody is in Bend, Oregon. Hi, Cody. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, pleasure to talk to you. You too. What's up? Um, so my wife was in a accident, uh, a vehicle accident, um, going on a month now. Wow. And Everybody okay? Uh, no, bumps and bruises, whiplash, that fun stuff. Ouch. Um, but it's still all whole, so that's good. Um. So the van that she got hit in was a specially equipped handicap van with ramps and tie downs and all kinds of stuff for her special needs daughter. So you, you get you got one in a chair. Well, most of the time. I mean, typically she rides in the front seat. Thank goodness in the accident she was in the front seat and buckled in. If she'd been in her chair, I think it could have been a lot worse. Um, well, long story short, we're in a little hatchback four door rental car that we have to fold the seat down to put her wheelchair and walker in. So that makes the car compatible for two people. Yeah. Um, so my well, did, question is... Did you is, have insurance on the van? Uh, we did. We do, and the, and the driver at fault did. Okay, so you're um, going to get your check. Well, unfortunately, he's only covered up to 25000 
What the, was the van worth? Well, in 2015, we paid 76000 for it. I didn't ask what it was worth in 2015. I asked what it's worth. <laughs> well, that's what we're still waiting to find out. Um, no, you don't need to wait to find out. You need, you know what it's worth. Well, we got a letter from a dealership. Um, we gave them the original sticker on it, and they came back at the value of around forty four. Okay, so it's a forty thousand dollar van, and you're gonna get a forty thousand dollar check. You gonna get a forty thousand dollar van? You just had one. Go get you another one. Well, and that's the thing. The van itself is a unicorn. I mean, that was gonna be our last. No, it's van. not. There's no such thing. Vans aren't unicorns. Okay. I mean, there's and special the next- needs vans out there for forty grand that are used. Uh-huh. They got a wheelchair ramp and got tie downs. Right. And Besides that, she doesn't is, even sit in a wheelchair that much anyway. But I mean, I want you to take care of her. But but I'm already I'm already in running you on where you're going. No, I'm not going to tell you to go buy a seventy six thousand dollar van. You were driving a forty thousand dollar van. And it was doing just fine. Right. You have a you have to go hunting for a needle in a haystack. But it's not a unicorn. It's going to be a difficult look. There's not one on every corner. Every lot doesn't have a special needs van on it. But you've been living in the special needs world. You know how to source these things. And dude. You don't go into debt for this. There's no reason to. You can provide the needs of your family for $40,000. It can be done. Or buy a $20,000 van and equip that puppy. One of the two. These are all possibilities. they got a wheelchair niece, and they've got a wheelchair van, and we know they fight this stuff. It's a hard thing you're fighting, but it can be done, and don't use it as an excuse to go into debt. It's not. If you're looking for ways to update your home without blowing the budget, I've got it. For years, I've been telling you about our friends at Blinds.com. Blinds.com makes it simple to shop top quality blinds, shades, and interior shutters from home with easy online ordering and free shipping. With Blinds.com, there's no need to renovate your entire home. Just change out what's on your windows with upscale choices like faux wood blinds, cellular, and roller shades or even outdoor shades. Plus, Blinds.com guarantees the perfect fit, whether you do it yourself or you have them measure and install everything for you. Shop their latest looks and see how much you can save at Blinds.com today. The easy and affordable way to make your home more beautiful is Blinds.com. personality is my co-host today in Boise, Idaho. Caleb and Katie are with us, and it says on my screen that they're debt-free. Way to go, guys! Yeah. <laughs> How are you? How much have you paid off? $99,409.13. I'm just going to call it 100 Way to go! <laughs> How long did this take? 38 months. 38 months. And your range of income during that time? Hundred and two thousand, and now we're at one hundred and forty-three thousand. Cool. What do y'all do for a living? I am working finance. Mm-hmm. I'm an analyst. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and I own a roofing company. Ah, very good, good, very good. So, what kind of debt was the one hundred thousand dollars? You know, we were very normal. <laughs> um, we had a uh, forty-five thousand student loans, fifteen thousand on a car. Uh, twelve thousand on an HVAC system, and then credit Bunch cards of, yeah. and hospital stuff, and all and, the things. Yeah, you had quite a collection. Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are normal. Well done. Good job knocking this out. So, uh, how long have you been married? Ten, ten years. years. <laughs> I almost said that. Yeah, that it takes about ten years to make a mess that big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then we got started listening to you and. 
and uh, decided it was time to change. Yeah. So the radio show woke you up? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Then, then what happened? You went, okay, that guy on the radio sounds weird, 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 weird. Wait a minute. We need to do this. What'd you do? <laughs> yeah. We had uh, my dad pushing us pretty hard towards it for a while, and we kind of, you know, kept calling him crazy. And then, then we started listening to you, and uh, it all kind of made Maybe. sense yeah. once uh, once we started listening. And hearing other debt-free screams was a big help and all that good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. So uh, your dad is pushing you, which makes you kind of push back and go, nah, I think I'll be my own people. We're going to be our own yeah. people. And then you look up one day and go, e, I got to do this. And I, the worst part about it is I got to tell him I'm doing it. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, Katie, whose idea? Who was it start talking about this first, you or Caleb? It was me. I We had kind of talked about it. He had mentioned his dad saying things, and then I just – started listening to it the student loans were mostly mine and they made me literally feel like i was in handcuffs mm. so um i just wanted to be done with them i just wanted to have more freedom in my life and it was a pretty emotional thing for me but i started listening to you um more and hearing those debt-free screams i just i was I, it was one of those things where i was like i didn't feel like it could ever happen but i also knew it had to oh caleb so the story now unfolds your dad is after you now your wife is after you yeah, I had it come in in both Yeah, you got it from both and, sides, uh, man. You had no choice. I had to bite the bullet and uh, <laughs> kind of just decide to agree with the wife uh, eventually. <laughs> it's a wise man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Good job, dude. Good job. Well oh, done. All it right, did, so it you, did, you're listening well. to the Dead Free Screams, and you're going, okay, hope, hope, hope. We can do this. Hope is coming. And what was the first thing you did out on a tactical level, practically, to start making this change? It was actually uh, January 1st of 2019. We'd kind of been talking about it, and I told him, because I, I paid all our bills, and so I just told him we have to sit down together and really look at what our debt actually is because I knew there were a lot of things that were kind of coming in, but I never wanted to look at it all together because it was so overwhelming. Mm. Um, and we got home from a trip, and Caleb was like, okay, let's sit down and do it. And that was such a big moment because we kind of talked about it, but him saying like, let's sit down and look at it. It made, it honestly was like an instant relief just having him in it with me. And then mm. we wrote everything out and it was pretty much from there. We were just like, let's do it. Yeah. So when you wrote it all down and you saw it was a hundred grand, 99,400 and something, <laughs> what was your first reaction? Uh, holy cow. <laughs> I think she edited that. It might've been a little saltier than that. <laughs> Yeah, it might have been, but I don't know if it's radio appropriate. So. Yeah. <laughs> Holy debt, great. Batman. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then, but then, then you start to run the math back against it, going, we make 102, we could make 143. And you start going, oh, wait a minute, we can do this. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big thing, too. We were like, we make, we make a decent amount of money. How are we not seeing any of it? Hmm. How are we so tight every month? Yeah. How is it we make six figures and we're broke? Right. Yeah, exactly. In Boise, freaking Idaho. I mean, my God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, really? it shouldn't have, shouldn't ever be the the case uh, here. And uh, for a hundred thousand, yeah, we should have been living high on the hog. But uh, it was every month, you know, worrying about what bill we're going to pay next. And uh, yeah, it it saved our marriage too, uh, as far as getting on the same page and and looking at everything and budgeting every week and. Really being a team. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to know, was there a moment where you saw the momentum where either you, you had a conversation and maybe one of your budgeting meetings, because you just described, you guys laid it all out and it seems like you were on the same page at that point. When did you experience that feeling of, we have this, we're going to be able to do this. Let's go. I think after about like a year and a half in, we decided to do Financial Peace University and because we kind of we were like motivated and then we lost it just like a little bit mm -hmm. and we're like let's do this and i feel like after that we were like holy cow like we really are going to finish this wow yeah the first year we really hit the ground running pretty hard and then you know about in the year and a half territory we you know we weren't necessarily davish but we had some we had the you know, birth of our son that we cash flowed and needed a bigger car that we cash flowed. We didn't go crazy on that, but uh, we wanted to get a nice big car, but we talked ourselves out of it. Yeah. And then we did Financial Peace University, and uh, that kind of got us ramped back up again. And 
and ready to. I get, love that. It's like the runner's right. win, Dave. Yeah, it's a water break at the halfway point. Yeah, yeah. That's and here incredible. we go. Game on again, and you kick back your pace back up and go. Mm. Yeah, good yeah. for you guys. Well done. Well, Financial Peace University serves a lot of different. Uh, things in people's journey it, sometimes it starts them sometimes it finishes them in your case it was the water break in the middle that's pretty cool i love it yeah we kind of kept saying like oh we don't need it we've we listen to the radio you know we listen to dave on the radio every day and we got this we know what to do but it really did help uh help a us a lot yeah. uh, in that halfway spot to uh just keep us keep us pushing and keep going way to go guys so proud of y'all who was your biggest cheerleader outside the two of you Probably our kids, our yeah, daughter. <laughs> yeah, our, our daughter was, you know, she she reminded us all the time we need to get this debt paid off. And <laughs> How, old was, <laughs> How old well, is she? How old is she? She's seven now. Oh, wow. she's a little kid. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Very little good. Kid, too. Yeah. She knew it was important to us, and she was, she was, uh, we had the list of all of our debts on the fridge, so she, she would see us cross it off and, and get excited every time we crossed one off. And um, so, yeah. Yeah, I love it. Very cool, you guys. So I'm sure your dad's dancing in the street. Yes, he was very excited yeah. when we told him we are going to be doing a debt-free screen. So. <laughs> we just found out he was texting the whole family. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So uh, what do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? Uh, it's, I mean, it's it's kind of yeah, cliche on. now, but getting on the same page with a budget every week and getting it all written out and seeing it on paper yep. uh, makes a big difference. Yeah. And holding Cli- each other accountable. Yeah, exactly. Well, cliches come from something being the truth. That's where they come from. So yeah. it's okay. Yeah. Well done, y'all. Hey, we got a copy of Baby Steps Millionaires for you, How Ordinary People Built Extraordinary Wealth, How You Can Too. Number one bestseller. That is the next chapter in your story to be baby steps millionaires i just met some out here a few minutes ago so uh young ones too very good job you guys and a copy of total money makeover for you to give away hundred thousand dollars paid off in 38 months making 102 to 143 caleb and katie in boise idaho count it down let's hear a debt free scream three two one we're debt free They're free. This is the Ramsey Show. This is the Ramsey Show. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225 as we talk about your career, your job, your mental wellness, your relationships, your money, everything. Hey, if you've done something stupid with money, welcome to the human race. If you've done something stupid with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. Every one of us have done something stupid with money. Even Ken Coleman oh. has done stupid stuff with money. Yeah. Got a Even whole folder. Coleman. Whole folder. I I mean, I've, I've made a living telling the story of uh, of me doing stupid with zeros on the end. I, I've done a lot of stupid things. And uh, years ago, I, I decided on the, on the air that when I do something stupid with money and it costs me money, I call that money that it cost me stupid tax. And we've all paid some stupid tax. My goal is to never pay the same stupid tax twice. Mm -hmm. Don't make the same mistake twice and and start calling it. Because at some point, it's not making a mistake. At some point, it's just stupid. You know, but if you pay, if you've lost money doing something stupid with money, then you have paid stupid tax. And, um, 
we're going to gather up. We, we have heard some absolutely hilarious, endearing, fun, and inspiring stupid tech stories over the years. We used to do a whole hour, a theme hour of stupid tech stories, and we would just, it was comedy. We would all just laugh together at how stupid we all can be. It's not calling somebody stupid. It's calling what you did stupid. I'm not stupid, but I have done some stupid things. There's a difference. A big difference. It's not an identity. It's not shaming. Dave, you're shaming people. No, I'm not, you little snowflake. I'm shaming your misbehavior. There's a difference. Yeah. Are you just laughing from the lessons learned? Yeah. I mean, by, it, you, by the way, ouch, it's in the that past. That left a mark. Might as well laugh about it. And if somebody else can get some, some, you know, we hear this over and over. Here's why I love the stupid tech stories. In some ways, they're very much like the debt-free screams. You hear call after caller, or people staying on our stage go, I listened, I watched, and I got inspired. Well, when other people hear your stupid tech stories, and they're in the middle of stupid, they're not going to judge themselves as much. They see you on the other side now, of it laughing. That other guy was stupid. Just and like so me. That's, it's not only entertaining, it is really life-giving. Yeah. It, it, it's shame-removing, not <laughs> shame-giving. For those that's, of you concerned about the shaming issue. Oh, and pro- trust me, people are. Shame on you, Dave. That's I've a bad word. I've lost all respect for you, Dave. I'm sorry. I wasn't taking a poll. Okay. Stupid tech stories. We need some stupid tech stories because we're going to start featuring them again here on the air. So upcoming segments on stupid techs, I want you to go to RamseySolutions.com slash ask, RamseySolutions.com slash ask, which is actually the portion of the website dedicated to Kelly because people send Kelly messages there, and most of them are nice, and most of the messages she sends back are nice. So (laughs) it is Kelly. So, yeah, you go to RamseySolutions.com slash ask, put stupid techs in the subject line, Give a little brief description of the time that you paid stupid tax. And Kelly will contact you. She will be nice. She will not shame you. And she will um, laugh with you. We will laugh with you, not at you. And um, does she, when she reaches out to people, they, she go, hey, that really was stupid. <laughs> We'd love to have you on the show. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so stupid. Yes. We need you on the show. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how she does it. We'll have to find out. Okay. So. RamseySolutions.com slash ask. Put stupid text in the subject line, and you can be part of the show. We'll feature you either as a caller uh, telling your story, or we might even feature it in long form and written. But if you send us like seven-page emails, it doesn't translate to yeah, radio. it's not going to so make it. It doesn't make it. One page is one minute. That would be stupid. <laughs> well, for different reasons. But yeah. yeah. All right. Jake is with us in St. Louis. Jake, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave. Hey, Ken. How you doing? Better than we deserve, brother. How can we help? Had a quick question. So I, I, I've been teaching lead and FPU, and I just actually just finished financial coach master training. Cool. And I've been telling people for years about HELOCs and stuff that they've been that are just a you know credit card attached to your house. Exactly. Um, but I had a quick question. We were my wife and I were walking the other day in our neighborhood, and our, one of our neighbors told us, "Hey, I was looking to move, but housing market's crazy." And my banker told me I have seventy thousand dollars of equity. So he, I don't know if he did a cash out refinance or whatever, but um, was doing, instead of buying a new home, he was upgrading his home. And I guess my question is, is what is the difference between doing that as long as you're doing it to actually upgrade your home and just buying a new home and financing all of that stuff already in the home? Well, the biggest thing is, is these are repairs or updates you should have been doing all along. And so they don't come at you at $70,000 in one bill. And if you can do them $70,000 in one bill, you can do them in phases and you can cash flow them. And then you don't need to add the debt. Um, Obviously, you know from Coach Master Training that even with a mortgage, we're going to teach you to get out of the mortgage. So we don't want you every time you want a nicer home to move up in home or to renovate your home, either one. We want you to pay cash for doing either one of those things, because ultimately we want to end up being 100% debt free. So I would reframe the approach and say, um, instead of let's figuring out a time that debt is okay, let's figure always figure out a way to avoid it. And just okay. not even I, ask the question is my point. Um, so, I mean, your neighbor didn't ask you for coaching or me. And so, but had they asked me for 70,000 bucks, I, I'm going to guess and say he probably could have cash flowed that in 24 months. 
or maybe 36 months and done it in three projects because it's probably not just one thing. And um, if it is a $70,000 single improvement, that's highly unusual, highly unusual. Uh, now, you could do a $200,000 addition to a property, and that would not be unusual. Uh, in that case, I just move, personally, uh, in mo almost every case, and you hear me say that all the time. But even when you move, you're moving into a better property, you're go going further into debt. Now you got to turn around and reverse the process again and start getting out of debt again. And so I'm always trying to figure out a way to, to, to stop the borrowing, not figuring out a way that it's okay Wonder what conditions is the borrowing okay? Instead of going that way, it's always figure out a way to stop the borrowing. Because see, what I did, Jake, as you know, is when I went broke, I vowed I never borrow money again. And so this is not an option for me. If I want to upgrade my house, I want to move up in house, I want to fix something in my house, there's only one method I can use. Because I'm never going in debt again. There's only one method I can use. I have to pay cash. We're nowadays we got more zeros on some of our projects. We're building a conference center on top of the hill here, right above this building, uh, that's about forty million dollars. Uh, we're about halfway through it, a little more than halfway through it. Um, I'm at about twenty six million in right now, and uh, we got about a year left. So that tells me I got about two million bucks a, a month to cash flow this puppy out the door. And we're watching it cash on cash, cash on cash, cash on cash. And I'm from Antioch, Tennessee. I don't know where you came from, guys, but that's a lot of money to me. That still freaks me out. You start talking about $2 million for something, you start talking about $2 million a month for something, that just blows my little country mind, I'll tell you. But that's what God has said we're able to do. We have the money. He's showing us to do it. We're doing it. And we're going to help a lot of people with that conference center, and that's a tool and what we're doing with it. It's not something I'm buying for personal consumption. Um, so, um, eh, you know, so, again, if I want a conference center – I got to rent one. I got to use something around here and stack chairs too high. Mm -hmm. We have to have cubicles that are two stories or something in here uh, until we can afford to do a different building, a better building, because we just don't borrow money. We just took it. Uh, you know, Anthony O'Neill used to say it well when he was here as a Ramsey personality. He said, you have to take debt off the table. Mm. I never said it that way before him, but it's a good it's a good way to remember. Just take debt off the table. So my point is, Jake, not is it okay you're probably gonna be okay but we're not trying to get to okay we're trying to quit borrowing money that's the new framework on it so how can we do this and not borrow money or maybe we don't do it at all if we can this is the ramsey show Hey folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Get your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from The Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. As we talk about your jobs, your career, your money, your mental wellness, and your relationships, all right here on The Ramsey Show. Thank you for joining us. Debbie starts off this hour in New York City. Hi, Debbie. Welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hi. Um, hi, Dave. Hey, what's up? I hope you're doing well. I am. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, so, my question um, I know that I'm very new. I but I've already cut. I've already closed six credit card accounts. Good for you. And yeah. So and I have a question. Although it's a little far in the future, considering where I am with my debts, 
but you say to put the to do the three to six a month emergency funds from what I've heard from your show and from reading your books. Um, after you do all your debts other than your mortgage. But I don't have a mortgage because I rent. My husband and I, we rent. Mm -hmm. And um, so my largest debt is a $93,500 student loan. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of, and my other debts, to get, and all together, the debts are like almost $190,000. Uh, besides what I already put just cut up. <laughs> anyway, so my question is, I'm, I'm just concerned that it'll take me for, that I'll never get to the emergency fund or it'll take way too long if I do the student loan f before I do the emergency fund. My husband, you know, his income isn't 100% ste steady because he, you know, self-employed and, um, you know, and what do you my guys income make a year? is all taken up on my debts. <laughs> what, do you, what do you make a year? Household income. Um, I actually it. looked it, looked it up last year. I made one hundred six thousand two hundred thirty eight. What did he make? That I don't know exactly. I just his income really varies. It's less than mine right now. Um, it used to be more. Um, he has a steady thirty thousand dollars, and then it goes up and down depending upon how much work he has. And it's uh, and um, what does but he, I don't know what does exactly. He, what does he do? He's an electrician, um, and uh, why is he not covered up in work? He's eighty-four years old. Well, there's that. He's um, <laughs> yeah. My husband's a lot older than me. Okay. Um, so he's eighty-four. So he doesn't really do the work himself, and uh, he, he just you know backs up other people. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. I bet. And so. So how old are you? So he does. So he doesn't like you know. So he just gets a, like a small yeah. fee. Yeah, you know. So how old are you? Fifty-nine. Okay. Cool. All right. Good for you. Well, I'm glad you're attacking this, and in general. There's a power to focus. So you've got $130,000 plus or minus income to attack almost $200,000 yeah. in debt. Yeah. Ouch. What was your student loan for? Nursing and then first the two loans, the original nursing degree. Then I, this would be my stupid, <laughs> I went for the master's, but I did it as a bridge program because I had a bachelor's. So now the master's did me bupkis. No, everyone wanted me to have the BSN, but my bachelor's is in another thing. So I feel, so I have a borrower's defense case now for that part of, for that part of loan, I have a borrower's defense case active. And right now, I, I'm in forbearance because of that. I mean, even when everyone else has to pay back their loans because of the pandemic freeze is ending, I still don't have to pay until they decide my case. Right. Um, so right now I'm not even focusing on that at the moment, and I don't know if I'll win or not. And if I do, I'll still have for the original degree. Right. Um, which is like so you, you are you are a nurse money. today. I'm yeah. I'm a school nurse. I mean, I'm still an RN, but I work in a school. Okay. All right. I have a quick question on that, Dave. Are you maxed out with the, with the the degree you have and experience you have as a nurse? Are you maxed out, or could you make more than than the one hundred and six? Um, I tried to get um, back in the hospital, um, and no one would even interview me. Well, I didn't ask and, you that. I'm uh, just saying, are you maxed out in the marketplace? Could is you there make something more? else you can do with an RN that makes you more than you make now? Not that I'm aware of. No. I mean, NP, but I couldn't do that because I don't have the experience in anything that you can get an NP in because I spent most yeah. of my time in the school. Yeah, right. So um, I, can't, I can't go for a postgraduate certificate program as a right. practitioner because of that. Right. Okay. And I also work for my husband's business at night. You know, it's like I work, oh, I work all day in the school. Yeah, and whenever I, I, listen, I'm his, not his business school, doesn't make enough money that you have to work for it much. Yeah, well, it's, sometimes it's busy, sometimes it's not. And yeah. he also doesn't even know how to turn on a computer, so I have to do everything computer-related, even his emails. Yeah. Like, you know, like some people read their own emails. I have to yeah, go Yeah, but if all, all of that's emails. making you $5, it's not worth it. You might hire somebody to do that. It'd be cheaper if you could make more money doing something else. But So don't get caught in that. So the answer to your overall question is uh, you have a really high – I mean, you're in a pretty deep hole with a medium-sized shovel. And that's what we always call it, the shovel to hole ratio. What's the ratio of your income to the debt? And you have one hundred and thirty to $150,000 household income with $200,000 in debt. 
And so if we paid uh, uh, $50,000 a year on it, it takes four years. If we pay $75,000 a year on it, it takes three years. And that means that you're living on beans and rice, rice and beans. You're living on nothing, scorched earth, below nothing in New York City to be able to pull that off. And uh, that's why we're scratching around here, because if we can add twenty or $50,000 to this equation on income, it gets you out of debt a bazillion times faster. And whether or not to save for the emergency fund is really not going to be your problem. Your problem is you have got to, for the first time in your life, address this ridiculous debt situation because it's spiraled out of control on you. And so, I mean, we can argue about or discuss the theories of baby step one being $1,000 or do you move baby step three ahead, but none of that changes the fact that you have $200,000 in debt and you've still got to address that. And so... You know, if you say I'm going to save $10,000 for a little emergency fund before I move on to my student loan, fine, go ahead and do that. But it doesn't, it doesn't address the issue. The issue is you've got to do something pretty radical and begin to attack this debt at a level you have never considered before. And, uh, and that's what we're outlining is this intensity and this level of sacrifice to be able to be free and be clear because the last thing I want you to be is 10 years older and still sitting here and he's gone and, and he's gone to heaven. You know, I, that's not what I want for you. And so I, I want you to have a better life than that. And, and it's going to involve some, you know, it's a big mess. So it's going to involve some big changes and some big sacrifice to get there. Uh, it's not a little mess. So I'm honored to have you in my audience. Thank you for calling, Debbie. I know it's scary, and I want you to feel free to call us anytime. We'll always help you. You keep fighting it. I think you can do it. But, buddy, I mean, you got a mountain to climb, girlfriend. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're not using Pure Talk for your wireless, you're paying too much. Pure Talk gives you the same great 5G coverage on the same 5G network as one of the big guys for half the cost. The average family saves over $800 a year. Go to puretalk.com and choose the affordable plan that's right for you. With their 30-day risk-free guarantee, you have nothing to lose. Go to puretalk.com and enter the promo code RAMSEY to save 50% off your first month. been a long time as a matter of fact as far as we're concerned around Ramsey way too long since we've been able to talk about and do our live events and we are doing real live events with people in them and everything and when you come to event an event with us you're going to spend the whole day digging into all areas of your life money personal growth leadership mental wellness your career all of it It's called the Smart Conference. You're going to leave hyped up, ready to make real change. We love doing the day-long Smart Conference. It's all the Ramsey personalities. Plus, this year, our good friends Craig and Amy Groeschel from Life Church are coming to do a section on marriage. And, oh, my goodness, this is incredible. You got it. Smart Conference is back. It's been three years. We're pumped. We're going to be in Dallas October the 22nd on Saturday all day long. When you leave at the end of the day, you you will be smart. You got to love it. It's our biggest event of the year. You don't want to miss this jam-packed event. Rachel Cruz, Dr. John Deloney, our own Ken Coleman, Christina Ellis, Pedro Latore. Of course, well, where is George Camel? There he is. George Camel's on here. Oh, I'm going to be there. Yeah. 
and as I said, Greg and Amy Groeschel. It's pretty incredible. Tickets start at just $39. It's a great price for a full day of smart. Get your tickets right now before they sell out. They are selling very quickly. You know all these live events and concerts. Anything that's happening in, in mass right now is selling like crazy. All of our stuff is going really, really fast. We've got an Orlando wealth building event up for sale right now. Ken Coleman and John Deloney are going to come to that as well. Be signing books afterwards during everything else. We're going to be out in the lobby seeing you guys. We miss being with you in all these cities. And so we love being on the road and, and being out there with the peoples. So uh, come out, guys. RamseySolutions.com slash events for the Smart Conference, October the 22nd. Or if you want to do Building Wealth in Orlando, May 19th, it's on the books as well. I'm going to be telling you about more of the Building Wealth events Um we're going to do one more of those here in the spring and four more in the fall around the Smart Conference. We're going to be all, all over the place in cities all across America. You do not want to miss this. The, net, the other city might sound like this. It might sound like Las Vegas, but I can't say that yet. No, it sounds like it, though. It sounds simple, okay. similar to that. But you know, when we, we had to make the announcement, that's kind of how it is now. <laughs> and I want to tell people, we had a lot of new people uh, joining the show, listening to new listeners. If you've never been to a Ramsey Solutions event, i got to oh, tell you something. Man. We're not just going to give you it's practical, epic. hope-filled, transformational content. Can I tell you how much fun we have? And we, we, we really do try, and we succeed at letting the audience have fun. Not just listen and learn, but we have fun. And it's, I suspect, coming out of the pandemic dave i promise it's you gonna be electric i promise you you will laugh every 12 minutes and you will cry at least once every 30 to 40 minutes oh boy there's some i pressure. promise you oh I promise boy. you and that's just while ken speaking <laughs> every 12 minutes <laughs> that's quite a guarantee there i just, folks. I just made that up i know yeah. you did <laughs> yeah, yeah but it's fun it is and fun. you will leave changed blast. and you will leave transformed and it's it's a blast yeah elizabeth is with us in uh charlotte north carolina hi elizabeth how are you hi dave hi ken i'm great how are y'all better than i deserve i was in your fair city yesterday speaking at elevation church for my friend pastor stephen furtick it was a blast how are you how can i help wonderful um yeah so i'm i'm doing great better than i deserve as well um and i've got problems my husband and i we bought a truck uh and we paid cash for it but the dealership listed our bank as a lien holder so the dmv issued the title and sent it to the bank so now uh the dmv says they can't reissue the title without a lien release from the bank and the bank is saying well we don't have a lien to release and we're kind of going in circles here. How do I get my title back? <laughs> well, this is this is that's ridiculous. Okay, yeah. um, the the dealership can solve this. They can reissue the title, or your bank can, can quit being stupid and release a lien that they don't have. All you got to do is sign the back of the title and say the lien is released. There's no. It doesn't so have to be an accounting they... transaction for your bank. Your bank's being an idiot. How do we get the title for the bank to sign the back of it, though? Where is the title? The title was mailed. It was never That's issued? That's a good question. Well, if it was issued with they a lien issued. holder, it went to the lien holder. It went to the bank. That's that's what the DMV told us, and the bank is saying they don't have it. And oh, they sure. do. Your bank is incompetent. Yeah. Who I are you bank with? with bank of America um, or something? A fifth third. Oh, God. They're awful. Here we go. <laughs> well, yeah, they're, they're they're incompetent for sure. And um, so the dealership. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay. It, yeah. So here, here's the thing: climb all up in your banker's face and climb all up in this dealership's face. The dealership can reissue the title. Okay. I mean, and and for that matter, you can call the state. What was the state telling you? The state's saying yeah, we issued a title. We don't. We issued a title. We've done our job, and it had a lien on it. Right. Yeah, they're saying, well, the dealership told us there was a lien, which I'm going, but there wasn't. And the signed purchase paperwork I have does say in all caps under the lien holder box, none. Yeah, well, there, should, there shouldn't be but a lien. You pay cash for pretty it. Pretty clear. Yeah. How much was the truck? It was twenty three thousand and Good change. Lord. 
Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dance on the face of your banker and get their attention, and then I'm going to change banks when this is over because you have a horrible bank. And the other thing is I'm going to go over to the dealer and go, guys, look, I didn't do this. You've got my money. I don't have a title. Are you going to solve this, or am I going to have to have an attorney contact you to solve this? I didn't create this problem. It's not on me to fix it. You created this problem. It's on you to fix it. Yeah. I, I, I just don't know if the problem's not at the DMV, to be honest with you. If they're saying there's a well, thing. Well, no, the, the bank or the, the DMV is saying that the dealer told them there was a lien. Yeah, but the but that's not adding up. I got to tell you, that's no, the where The dealer's I incompetent. The dealer, the, the finance, dealer has finance to fix office it. at the dealership got sloppy. That's right. And they made a mistake. And right. instead of going and fixing their mistake, they're running around acting like this is Elizabeth's problem. Yeah. So I'm going to make it some other people's problems, and you're yeah, going to have to right. keep You got 26000 bucks on the line. You got to get a title. The dealer. Yeah. I, I mean, I, this is like losing twenty six thousand dollars. Like you yeah, lost twenty six thousand dollars of my money. You probably need to find it. it. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like the dealership could fix it, which may be a better route than the bank, just because the bank is such a big bank. Maybe no. the dealership. I, I agree with. I think it's the dealer, well, Dave, that needs to fix it because this is what they do. Yeah, That's the, the whole part the, of this buying is the it problem with dealing with someone like Fifth Third or Bank of America. They're so big and they're so stupid and they don't care. Yeah, a normal bank that yeah. cared could fix this. All that because there's no harm to the bank whatsoever on releasing the lien on the back of the title and releasing it back to you, even though there was never any lien. They don't have to do an accounting entry. Some duber called a banker needs to get the title out of the box, sign the back of it, and send it to you. It's that simple. And the whole thing's over okay. then. But you got to find somebody with a brain at Fifth Third Bank. Good luck with that. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. the problem. That's why I tell people not to bank with these banks like this. We bank with smaller community banks, regional banks, and credit unions. It's the only time I tell people to bank with people because you can actually find a human being that A, cares, yeah. and B, has two brain cells. Because if you had two, if you had three brain cells, you would have quit your job if you were at Fifth Third and gone and gotten a good job. You know, but no, you're staying there. It means you hadn't listened to the Ken Coleman show and gone and gotten a good job. You know, this is oh, like the God. start of a bad joke. A car dealer, a banker, and a DMV staffer walk into a bar. Walk into a bar. <laughs> like, and, and, and between the three of them can't find a brain cell. This is the triangulation <laughs> of incompetence. <laughs> it's like, Bless her heart. It's, <laughs> so that's what she's stuck in. The triangulation of incompetence. You are in the Bermuda Triangle yes. of incompetence. The DMV, a banker, and a car dealer. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Ramsey Show. If you're considering a career in technology, I recommend Bethel Tech, and I'm not alone. Here's what Brendan said. Before Bethel Tech, I was driving Uber. Within four months of graduating, I got a job paying $60,000. About two years after that, I got a remote job that pays me $130,000, all thanks to what I learned at Bethel Tech. You could be next. Get started today at BethelTech.net and get $1,000 to $2,500 off of your tuition. Again, it's BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman. Joining us, America. We're glad you're here. Open phones at 888-825-5225. So the social media team just told me that the uh, Instagram account, which I didn't even know existed for a long time, um, when Instagram first came out, 
I didn't even know how to do it because I was on Twitter. Remember when Twitter was a big deal back? Oh, when, it was back when everybody was on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, I was on Twitter and I had like a hundred thousand people on Twitter. I thought I was a big deal, and then I got to like five hundred thousand on Twitter, and I just knew I was a big deal. Then I'm joking. Well, yes, because yes. Twitter does not define you. I can promise no. you that. And uh, then Twitter just started to deteriorate. Yeah, and it's all trolls now. It's a it's total just, jungle. It's a, it's a, it's like all. The mental illness on parade. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy. It's lost. Very bitter people. The bitter, angry. It's yes. really the, it's, it's the, it's the black hole of social media. <laughs> and so, um, uh, anyway, so then I, I just got off of Twitter. I mean, we have a Twitter account with my name. on. It's got about a million now, just under a million. And, uh, the guys all, they put stuff on there, but it's all hate. All the responses hate. Yeah. I could put on there free hundred dollar bills yeah. and somebody would go, that's yeah. not enough. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> where's mine you should for a fun example you should tweet the sun is hot and then wait for people to disagree with you on that yeah one. well yeah the, no well i mean and it, it's uh trump's fault right you know or i mean they just say some dumb butt stuff on there so uh, i was not paying attention to instagram and it got up you know like a million and a half two million people or something on there and uh so our instagram people are like dave you need to respect instagram because it's legitimate it's the gram so, is great the gram the gram oh like you're like you 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 and the gram are tight that was a you have a, a nickname for it this oh was an God. attempt for me to be relevant and, oh my and, God. and as soon as it came out of my mouth i you went. just went that was a, i regret saying this already yeah. before i even finished it yeah. it's like i always tell my kids i say check it out on the google and it irritates oh well, on, i do that on purpose it's yeah. just like a bad dad joke have you got that internet thing yeah same yeah. thing <laughs> So where you got big news? Well, yeah. On so the gram? apparently the gram. I'm now I'm now three million people oh, on the gram. Congratulations! And so um, yeah, slow clap for um, that. That's, yeah, yeah, slow clap. It's like a golf, nice par golf putt. Clap, golf so clap. Solid yeah. par putt there. Yeah, but the uh, uh, so and um, at Dave Ramsey. By the I, way, you know, if you I don't, want to I, I don't want to be real sarcastic or anything, but I'm supposed to like. It's, that's nice. That's Are nice. we supposed to celebrate? I, I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna be nice. I'm just gonna say that's very nice. Thank you for all of you that are out there. We know we've got about 20 to 25 million of you on this show out there and uh, 3 million of you on the gram. I didn't even know it was called this. Well, yeah, this is what the kids just, call it's, it. It's what, it's what, oh, really? Do they? Well, or you just know. made that up? Dave, you don't I'm 47. Know. I don't know. You don't have any idea My what cool kids, is. They don't even tell You me. and I together couldn't find cool in a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but here's the point. You should be following... The at Graham. Dave Ramsey on Instagram because it's well, good and, content. And Ken Coleman. While apparently, you're at it, apparently while somebody you're at it, cares. Give me a follow as Apparently well, sure. somebody cares. So there you go. There really is great content out there. It, well, it is. And, and we don't, good. I mean, but there's a few haters showing up on the gram. When the gram well, first came course, out, Dave. it was like nice people and it was all. The irony of was, social was, media is that it's not very social. It's, 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 people can be downright mean. And you mean nasty. those people on Facebook aren't really my friends, Ken? <laughs> I don't you mean they're so. not really my friends? Not until you say, well, they are until you say something that, that they don't them. like, and then you'll then find out. Then it's you know, over. It's a little different. It's like that relationship was shallow. Didn't last long. <laughs> we broke up. My on favorite Facebook. in the old days is when someone would tell you uh, unfollowed, and <laughs> as if you cared. Yeah. Well, and I would just went back and and when did I start taking a poll? <laughs> but I actually may hold the record for the most people blocked on Twitter. Oh, you think so? It's become like a thing with the kids to get blocked by me. Oh. So I quit doing it finally because it became like, I haven't been blocked by Dave Ramsey. I must not be cool. We should check the stats. But I'm I'm guessing it's over 10,000 I blocked because I used to just sit in the mornings and block them. <laughs> and, but it, now there's nobody left to not block. So you could just close the account easier yeah. because they're, man, I tell you, the number of people that are intelligent on Twitter is so low. It's so small. So um, they're just mean and mad. It's scary. Anyway, it's fun. This social media thing. and yeah. It's kind of all collapsing, though. I mean, it's, it's being shown up to be as fake as it is. Everybody's kind of figuring it out. Yeah. They're going like, those people on Facebook aren't really my friends. And, uh, and then Facebook starts throttling stuff and charging for everything, and everybody's pissed off at Zuckerberg. And then... And the gram is owned by Facebook. I now know. you got me calling it the gram. It's not even a thing which to is, call which it Which may the be gram. one of my greatest professional achievements. It's, <laughs> it's up there. <laughs> you and I could work together for the rest of our lives and not cause that to be a thing. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Mikey is with us. Get us out of this, Mikey. He's in Indiana. How can we help? Hello. How Hi. are you? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Um, I'm a junior at Indiana State and managing the business administration and mining entrepreneurship. Cool, good for you. Finance, 
Yeah, I want to start my own business. Um, I'm taking a finance class right now that we are learning real estate and how to manage money. Mm -hmm. But I'm struggling with what my professor is teaching us because it goes against the debt free principles that I believe in and learned in financial peace class in high school. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, some of the things that he says is that we should use credit cards for everything. Sure. So you get money back and can't rent a car or hotel or buy airline tickets with a debit card or cash. Yeah. He also said you need to a good credit score to, in order to buy a house. And, then and if you ask him about Dave Ramsey, he'll account. tell you Dave Ramsey's an absolute idiot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That'll come like, up. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I learned, yeah, and then he said we should take our equity in our house to buy new cars. He also said that payday lenders and okay. cars are necessary if you need to pay for something. So here's the so thing. My, Mikey, Mikey, my, oh, stop. Sorry. He's a finance professor, okay? He doesn't have any money. You're getting a degree in entrepreneurship, and one of the things is you have to learn to think critically and how to avoid these situations, okay? So what do you think the odds are that you're going to change anything he believes or teaches? I would say close to zero, wouldn't you think, Ken? Uh, Yes, guaranteed. I don't think there's anything that you can do or say or I can do or say that are going to change this guy's misguided bad teaching and bad advice. He's going to continue to do it. Okay. Is that a, st- okay. you believe that to be true, Mikey, he's going to continue to do it no matter what we do. Agreed. True. Okay. So now you got to decide. Like, like now that. you got to decide. Are you going to pass the class or not? Yeah. I have an A in that class. Okay. Right Just now. pass the class and move on. Okay. Cause you're not going to change the guy and you're way too smart to follow what he's saying. You know, he's wrong. You've got good critical thinking skills. You've compared his advice to what you've learned from us and his advice came up short and you found our stuff to be the truth. My joke always is, is that I learned to borrow money from my finance professor in college who was broke. A finance professor that's broke is like a shop teacher with missing fingers. I've been telling that joke for 25 years, and it still still gets a laugh. Yeah, Yeah. It's still funny because that's exactly the case here. So here's a funny one, Mikey. Get this. So my daughter, Denise Ramsey, at the time, she was not married at the time, was taking a personal finance class in college. And the guy not only did everything that you're talking about, but he always spent five to ten minutes every class trashing Dave Ramsey, not realizing his daughter was sitting in the room. Oh, wow. <laughs> and at the yeah, and, and she called me and she's upset and she's angry because she wants to defend me. And I said, darling, just pass the class. But at the end of the class, make sure you introduce yourself. And she said okay. when she introduced herself at the end of the class, she got an A because she answered his questions the way he wanted them answered. It didn't change her opinion. She's never borrowed a dime. Didn't change anything. And then she introduced herself at the end of the class and said, I've been sitting here for the entire time listening to you trash my father. But I wanted to make sure that you knew I was here and that you gave me an A and I wanted to thank you for the A. And she said the guy almost threw up. He almost oh, lost wow. it. He almost lost his cookies right there. So, I mean, that you just got to have some fun with this, dude, because it's, you're not going to change anything. Those convinced against their will are of the same opinion still. Sweet little Denise. Because yeah. she, she's non-confrontational. Non-confrontation. She's not like Rachel. She's non-confrontational. <laughs> Rachel would have been standing up now, in the middle of class having a heyday right there, and we'd have had to get her out of We'd still be reading headlines we'd on that. We'd still be reading headlines like her father. <laughs> she, she would make the Tennessean. <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. of the day, Isaiah 48, 17, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. 
Albert Schweitzer said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know. The only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Eric is with us in Austin, Texas. Hey, Eric, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey there, Dave. Hey, Ken. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, first off, uh, off the top, my wife and I have been doing the Dave Ramsey plan for seven years now, and you guys have uh, truly changed our lives, so I appreciate it. Cool. And you, uh, congrats on your Instagram following. You have three, more, <laughs> three million more followers than I do, so congratulations. <laughs> thanks, brother. Didn't but change hey, either have, one of our I lives. Have one of the, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I have one of those uh, good problems, I guess. My wife and I uh, are in baby step seven, so the house is paid off. Well, we're fully contributing. Uh, to our retirement funds and things. And basically, we're looking to upgrade the house. Uh, we just had our second kid, and so looking to get a, a few more square feet, I guess. And uh, right now, our house is about 450000 mm-hmm. and probably trying to look to uh, maybe the 650, 700000 range. Mm-hmm. And I guess, you know, what we've been doing is putting money on the side in this investment account, and it's about $1,000 a month. And so I guess my question comes down to, do I just have to wait for that little account to be a couple hundred thousand? Or I made up a new baby step called Baby Step 7B, where I pause some of my retirement and load it all up, kind of like on 3B, and try to pay cash that way. And so I was going to see your thoughts and, and get your wisdom on it. What's your household income? Uh, it's about 145 a year. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you're putting what percentage of the 145 away for retirement now? Uh, or do you well, know the total? Have, or do you know the total dollars? Uh, it's twenty five thousand split between two Roths and a simple IRA, mm-hmm. and then we have two five twenty nines going as well that are uh, probably about you know five to six thousand total. Okay, so a year. you're twenty five thousand on one hundred and forty five. You're that's only about fifteen percent, isn't it? Yes, sir. That's right. Okay. Um, and so and so we're saving an extra thousand into a into a separate account that we're calling house fund. Yeah. Okay. But, so course, here's you know, the thing. Going on here's the thing. Things, but... If you cut your retirement completely off, yes, sir. it still takes 10 years. Yes, sir. So we got to do something different, period. Regard The retirement doesn't save the, doesn't save the day. It doesn't, okay, I can do it in three years if I cut my retirement off. No, you can do it in 10 years if you cut your retirement off or eight years. I mean, yes, it still sir. takes forever. Right. So we need more than $1,000 going outside of retirement. Right. Because I don't want okay, you to cut so your retirement. Kind of I don't want you to cut and- yeah, I don't want you to cut your retirement off for 8 years, do you? No, I was thinking kind of like how on 3B you'll tell people to do it for like maximum of 3 years. I know, but that's only $25,000. It's like only 75,000. It doesn't get you there. If you're going to do it right, for 3 years, right. it needs to get you there. You follow me? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I totally get you in. And, yeah. you know, I follow, or we've, we've been on the no mortgage thing for the last few I, years. And, and I want to be and there. The does feel different. And, but I mean, yeah, so if you don't sure. have a mortgage payment, why, what was your old mortgage payment? Like 2000 So why can you only save 1000 Because you were paying 2000 when you put 15% yeah. away. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know. I guess we went a little bit more lavish on the trip. <laughs> How yeah. big's the house? Your current house? Uh, seven, 1,700 square feet. How many yeah. bedrooms? Uh, three. Okay, I'm moving up if I'm you, but the way I'm moving up is, is I'm going to get a lot more aggressive on saving for the house. I think, yeah, I think your lifestyle is what needs to be pinched, not your retirement account. Because you're, okay. you're not even willing to save your old house payment. Is this What's the first it? kid, Dave? I didn't pick up on if it was first kid or second kid. I thought it was first kid. It was, but the, I it's would tell okay. him to relax. It's okay to move up in house. It's going to take them three or four years anyway. They're probably going to have more kids, right, so right. it's okay. But the uh, uh, but the thing is, is you, you know, save three thousand dollars a month, and then we can talk about dialing the retirement back a little bit, but not completely off, and then you can get there. But don't talk to me about saving a thousand dollars a month because you're burning your money in lifestyle. You're not even saving your old house payment towards the new house. That's wimpy. That's what I'm saying. And, and I you agree. You were with already you. doing those numbers before. But you ought to at least be able to do that. 
I just think couples, they feel like they got to upgrade in the house because of one kid. And the point is they could have two two kids. They can share a room. I mean, they just don't need to be in a big rush here in the next year to two years here. Well, I'm okay if they are because they're going to be millionaires. I mean, they got a $650,000 house. They're going to be millionaires. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm agree with you. I'm just saying relax a little bit. It's okay to do it, but, you know, but <laughs> you're not – here's the thing. You never make enough money – that you don't have to choose something to say no to. Right. I don't care what it is. I mean, I know a guy makes $10 million a year, and he had to choose to say no to a new jet. <laughs> I mean, there's always something, right, that poor you can guy. say. Poor guy. Th- that you can say no to, right? Erica's in Boston. Hey, Erica, what's up? Hi, Dave. Pleasure to be on the show. Honor to have you. How can we help? Hi, so I'm in baby step two. I am $55,726 in debt. I um, am a mom of three kids, six, two, and four months. And I was just wondering if it's okay to start um, a family child care business because we do want one more child. However, we can't afford the daycare costs. Um, And this makes me a little nervous. Um, My mom is currently helping me take care of the kids. She is a child care provider, so she has her own business. And she's looking for me to take it over. Um, I was just wondering if this is a good idea while I'm still in baby step two. I am currently in an admin. Where's the I? I mean, are you single? I am married. Yes. So what does he make? So combined, our take-home pay is $64,608. And what do you make? Uh, That's our combined income. I know. What do you make? um, A year I make... um, Sixty-two thousand eight hundred. Your husband makes two thousand dollars. He makes two thousand dollars, two hundred and forty a month. Yes, and I make three thousand one hundred and forty-four. He currently just got a part-time gig, um, as well. You just told me you made sixty thousand dollars, but the household income was sixty-two thousand. Let's try again. Okay, what do you? What is your okay. annual income at your job, Erica? My annual income is sixty-two thousand eight hundred. What does your husband make at his job? Annually. Annually, I want to say like twenty nine thousand. Okay, so his he job started, sucks. Um, as a carpenter, yeah, his job sucks. Okay. He he just started his carpentry job um two years ago, so he's new, so he's not getting like a good pay right now. He did just get a part time gig to make up for it. Okay, um, and, he's looking um, into trade school to so become an. So you have to replace sixty thousand dollars worth of income keeping kids. Can you do that? Can I? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the can question? Can you make sixty thousand dollars keeping kids? Yes. If you can make as much as you're making now, and you want to change over to that, and you're and you're able to prove that today, you can do that immediately, taking over your mom's old business. Then that's okay. Okay. But if you're telling me you're going to take a pay cut, you can't afford to take a pay cut. Both of you can't have a job that sucks. Right. Exactly. That's exactly what I was worried about. Yeah. Um, I didn't know whether to like. So do you really know what you're going to make in this business? Exactly. Yeah, that's that's the problem right now. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's a pipe dream that's going to turn into a nightmare until you dial the numbers in. Ken? I, I, I really put the pressure on the hubs here. Uh, I make no apologies for that. He's going to have to step up in this economy as a carpenter, only mm-hmm. making twenty nine thousand dollars. I've got in questions. Boston. Boston. I got a lot of questions that we didn't have time to get into, but he can make double without blinking if he puts the effort in and he's got a good attitude clean record whatever i just don't know what's going on to where he's only making 29 as a carpenter my goodness in this economy with the he should be making boom. close to three times that with yeah. overtime yeah so I, I see a gap here yeah and if you want to change over to the child care thing erica you got to dial it in for the sake of your family i don't care what you do but for the sake of your family you got to dial it in and make sure you're gonna make at least as much make sure as you're making now. That puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Get your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from the Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts.